So tonight we visit the rules one and two from the St. Ignatius Rules of Discernment. And I think it's very providential that we are exploring these rules tonight. Tonight, of course, is the anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima's final appearance in Fatima. And we know that in that was a great time for conversion. Many people who were at Fatima were there out of skepticism. They were there because they wanted to prove these children wrong, wanted to prove their visions wrong. And we know that our Blessed Mother triumphed, her Immaculate Heart triumphed. And I see that as you know, the hope, not only in our own spiritual life and our own growth forward, but also in the people that might be in our lives that are, are away from God, that are struggling within that first rule, which is people who are going from mortal sin to mortal sin. So tonight we want this to be a night of hope. We want this to be a night of, of discernment, not only for ourselves, but also in how to pray for our loved ones and how to bring those people who are in our lives, who we see and we ache for, we ache for their conversion. And sometimes we don't know how to help them. But I think tonight we're gonna to learn some wisdom of how to sort of craft our prayers into prayers that can really be effective and efficacious in praying our loved ones and our friends to heaven. So the resource suggestions, again, just going over this with you, a lot of the text is taken from the Discernment of Spirits book from Father Timothy Gallagher. So if you're looking for a more detailed, you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of what is being covered tonight, I would suggest this book. If I did the whole book on slides and taught, taught everything that Father Timothy taught, um, we would be here for months and months and months. So he's a wonderful, wonderful teacher of these discern the, the discernment of spirits. And so I highly recommend this book if you're looking to go a little bit deeper and you want some more detail and some more examples. I've certainly pulled things from this book, but knowing that we have a timeline as well, I wanted to uh, respect everybody's time and just sort of keep our teaching to sort of between 40 and 45 minutes a night. The Examine Prayer is the book that I take our evening examine from. So there is a really great explanation of why we pray the way that we do in the examine from Father Timothy Gallagher. So again, if you're looking at uh, exploring that, then uh, that's the book that you want. Last time we were together, I did suggest writing down your spiritual experiences. And um, we talked a little bit about you know people who may not love to write, but the thing is, is that we want to be aware and we want to sort of take note, notes on what's happening around us. So that is something that I do recommend. And of course, prayer. So if you're a daily mass goer, we ask for you to bring our intentions to daily mass. If in your rosary each day, uh, in your Sunday mass, we, we need these graces to grow in faith. And so we ask you to partner with us in prayer so that the graces are unending and we just feel that that flow. Last week, I had the privilege of being at Our Lady of the Cape. It was my first time ever. And when I was at the Cape Shrine celebrating the launch of the New World Sword of St. Michael and the world release of the Bridge of Roses docudrama, which, by the way, I really, just a little plug here, Dennis will love this, I really, really encourage everyone to see it. Uh, so if you're watching this recording, I'm going to put the link to the trailer in the notes. And if you're watching live, please, if you haven't seen the movie or you haven't purchased the movie, it is just a grace-filled, incredible um, delight for the senses, we'll say that. So at the shrine, I lit a candle for the intentions of everyone that is doing this study in union with the graces of the Mass celebrating Our Lady of the Rosary. So last Wednesday, or sorry, last Thursday, we had that celebration. And I prayed that many, many graces will be with you as we go through this study and that God's grace unfolds this head knowledge into your heart so you can apply it and discover God's communication with you every day in a very special way. So what is the Sermon of Spirits? I'll just go over. This is the text of St. Ignatius. It is a set of rules for becoming aware and understanding to some extent the different movements which are caused in the soul, the good to receive them 
and the bad to reject them. And this study is not something that we just sign up for every other week and then forget about. Our life is a classroom. It is a classroom where we get to experience the loving graces of God. And we also get to experience sometimes the conflict that comes as we grow in holiness, as we grow in faith. And this study is certainly trying to de demystify and take the curtain down from the strategies of the enemy and how the enemy can play us and really deceive us into, um, into you know, coming away a little bit from the Lord. So we are learning this to apply it to our daily life. Our life, again, is a classroom, and this is where the experiment takes place, kind of like a science lab. The formulas and information don't make sense until you start putting these things in a lab. Or let's say a gym class. Can you imagine sitting in a class and reading about the rules of sports and reading about all the particulars about a sport, but never actually getting to the gymnasium or never actually getting to the field to play the sport? It would be boring. And the same way with our faith. So we can read so many things. We can read about the lives of the saints. We can read about you know, many different things. At times, we can even read scripture and not come alive. And, and that is where our faith really changes from the head to the heart. We want to partner with the Holy Spirit. We want to partner with our guardian angel, with the helps that God gives us so that we can encounter his grace and that we can come alive and fully live. And we see this in the life of St. Ignatius. And we'll see this a little bit later in the life of St. Augustine, because we're going to be looking at his life through a particular lens tonight. So the application of this study is what is life-changing. We will grow. If we apply these rules, we will grow in intimacy in our relationship with God. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 15, let uh, he who ears, let him, sorry, he who has ears, let him hear. It's not enough just to listen to the rules, but we must apply them to our life. So here again is the review of the enemy. What are we talking about when we talk about the enemy in this study? You're going to hear this word a lot. Sometimes St. Ignatius used in his applications of these rules, he uses the evil spirit but more often than not, he, he uses the enemy. And why does he do that? Because we have, as St. Paul says uh, in, in Galatians, and um, we see in John, and we see in uh, 1 Peter, we see in Matthew and Revelations, that we have, we have several enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil. So the flesh, again, is our own weakness in con concupiscence, as uh, the legacy of original sin in our, the world, uh, any, any spiritual harmful influence in the world that takes our eyes off the prize, which is our Lord. And we know that there can be so many distractive things. The world has gotten busier and busier. And sometimes I marvel at the fact that you know, we have all these electronics, we have all of these things to supposedly make our life easier. And yet life is busier than ever. And you know, sometimes we have to step back. We have to say, okay, maybe I need to do a fast from our phone. Maybe I need to do a fast from, you know, Netflix uh, and watching it, you know, show after show after show. These are the things that can get us tripped up in the world. And then, of course, the devil is the fallen angel that Scripture refers to in, in one Peter two as the adversary. He is roaring like a lion, just waiting to sort of come in and, and, uh, and take our mind over and present all different thoughts to us and distract us. He is the tempter in Matthew 4. He is the accuser in Revelations. And John tells us he's the liar. So we want to stay far, far away from him. And we can see this played out in the life of St. Ignatius. So in the flesh, he pursued carnal pleasures in his life, like his, the way that he was imagining things when he was laying in his bed, healing his leg, he was thinking of, you know, wooing a beautiful woman. He was thinking about the flattery that he would give her, thinking about the ways that he would talk to her. When we look at the world, we know that um, St. Ignatius had a problem with gambling. 
he pursued wealth. He, he thought that that was, was going to make him something. And he did have a gambling addiction. And we know that he also struggled with, with anger. He struggled with, you know, rage. He was part of the soldier, but he was a soldier that kind of didn't get up, give up. And he was, um, he was known for his, his heroic, you know, deeds, but he was also known for his anger and some things that he did that uh, weren't so great and that drove him out of a few cities. And that's part and parcel of his biography as well. So we, here we are, um, we do have an enemy. We know that we have an enemy, but we're not to be frightened of that enemy because we worship God, the, son, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God is omnipotent. He's omniscient, omniscient, sorry, omniscient, and he's omnipresent. What does that mean? Omnipresent means that he is all powerful. God is not subject to physical limitations like man is. Being omnipotent, God has the power over wind, over water, over gravity and physics. God's power is infinite and limitless. And we know that he uses the choirs of angels to, we, the saints have, have read, uh, wrote about this. Uh, scripture tells us about the angels who carry out his justice, who carry out various acts. And he's entrusted these acts to these angels. So we know that we need a closer relationship with our guardian angel who then speaks to the choirs of angels. And he's given us all of these graces to, to, to win the battle for him. And omniscient means all-knowing. So God is all-knowing in the sense that he is aware of the past, present, and future. Nothing takes him by surprise. His knowledge is total. He knows all that there is to know and can be known. This is the God that we worship. And sometimes I think when we, we look at, you know, the enemy, evil spirits, things like that, we need to know in, in the right place, you know, the, the enemy has his place. The enemy was created. The devil was created. He is a created spirit. And although, yes, he is powerful and he's intelligent, he is a grain of, of rice to, or a grain of sand, we'll say, to that of the Lord. And so we can't, re we can't forget that the Lord is for us. He loves us and he gives us all of the graces that we need to grow in holiness. God is omnipresent, meaning all present. This term means that God is capable of being everywhere at the same time. It means his divine presence encompasses the whole universe. There is no location where he does not inhabit. I'll just do a little disclaimer here. This does not mean that um, we're not talking about pantheism here. So pantheism is when God is synonymous with the universe itself. And that's not what we believe as Catholics, but we do believe that he is, he does, um, he is everywhere and uh, that he is distinct from the universe, but that he inhabits the entirety of the universe. He is everywhere at once. Wow, like that is just overwhelming. And so when we go before the tabernacle a little bit later, we bring our prayers, we need to remember who it is that we're going before. And, you know, maybe we need to ask for a greater fear of the Lord. Because sometimes I think just as, you know, I'm someone that has been Catholic all my life. I'm someone that, you know, certainly at times in her life have entered a church and have not been reverent, have, you know, done, have received Jesus irreverently. I'm guilty of that. That is my sin. And I've certainly gone to confession for that. But this is awesome news that this is the God that we worship. And this is the God that we consume. I mean, how awesome is that? That in our Catholic faith, we get to, to consume the God who actually made the universe. So in the Catholic Catechism, it says, we believe that his might is universal. For God who created everything also rules everything and can do everything. God's power is loving, for he is our father, and mysterious, for only faith can discern it when it is made perfect in weakness. Oh boy, is that good news. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me, because I'm a weak human being, and if his, you know, mysteriousness is in me because of my weakness, 
and me seeking him, seeking his face, desiring relationship with him, desiring to bow before him, and that that faith grows in me because of his grace, then praise be to God because we serve a loving and wonderful God. So let's look at the text of the first rule. And this is uh, from St. Ignatius's rules of discernment. So his, his actual rules are very, very simplistic, but Father Timothy Gallagher expands on them. He's really given us some, um, some great insight in his book. I just wanna extract some of that insight. So first rule, the first rule in persons who are going from mortal sin to mortal sin, the enemy is ordinarily accustomed to propose apparent pleasures to them leading them to imagine sensual delights and pleasures in order to hold them more and make them grow in their vice and sins. In these persons, the good spirit uses a contrary method, stinging and biting their consciences through their rational power of moral judgment. So, Another thing that God sowed into each and every one of us when he made us is reason. We have been given reason. It is a gift from God. And that's, you know, when we think about our soul and we think about sort of like that GPS signal, it means that he can still signal even the greatest sinner. And we will see this through St. Augustine's life. We see this in St. Ignatius's life, that even though they weren't thinking of God, that God has been sig can send that signal and he can form sort of that, um, his presence to turn the head of even the greatest sinner. And we know too that as Catholics, we pray, we pray for our loved ones. And intercessory prayer is so important. We're going to be talking a little bit about that later, um, just in how important that the graces when we pray for a person, especially when we pray through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, our Blessed Mother goes to visit the person that we're praying for. And her mere presence of our prayer in their life could be the head-turning moment. It could be that stinging and that biting in their conscience that helps them turn their head. So because St. Ignatius's rules arise from described spiritual experience, we're going to be discussing this rule in the context of the conversion of St. Augustine. The first and second rules are intimately related. And when we discuss the second rule, we will return to the experience of St. Augustine's conversion again to pull out the nuances that highlight the teaching of the second rule as well. So here we have St. Augustine. Perhaps one of the best known conversion experiences in our spiritual tradition is that of St. Augustine. In this famous depiction, we see the grace-filled moment in the garden under the fig tree when St. Augustine's long search for spiritual renewal is finally fulfilled. Through his tears, he hears the chant of a child beyond the garden wall. Take and read, take and read. He opens the scriptures and he finds the words from St. Paul in Romans 13, verse 12. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. In that instant, Augustine's, Augustine's life is remade and he starts a spiritual journey that will lead to great holiness. Our focus on this story will be the multifaceted set of interior moments in Augustine's heart that immediately precede the moment of the conversion. So there's a whole story that comes before that moment under the fig tree. We will see first in a broader context and then specifically their actual unfolding. And I want to invite you to pay particular attention to the conversion that happens in a nonchalant way, but deeply affects St. Augustine. Within our Marian, Marian devotional family, we've been called by our Blessed Mother to stand in the gap and to pray for the needs of others. 
We pray to reach unbelievers and people who have turned away from faith or through who no fault of their own have never been exposed to the faith. Like our Blessed Mother, we have hearts that burn for conversion. We know St. Augustine's mother, Monica, St. Monica, had a heart for her son. Augustine spent his adolescent years in a self-indulgent lifestyle. Perhaps we can relate to that in our own youth or see it played out in our siblings, our children, or our grandchildren, and very much in the culture of the world today. In his own words from the book Confessions, St. Augustine writes, in my youth, I burned to fill myself with evil things. I dared to run wild in different and dark ways of passion. This movement toward unrestrained self-indulgence stirs in Augustine's young heart and largely shapes the course of his life for years to come. We see here again, you know, poor Saint Monica is constantly pointing at Saint Augustine to the Lord and be praying for him. And the graces certainly follow St. Augustine. And that's why I believe so strongly in an intercessory prayer. When we pray, there is not one prayer that is wasted. That prayer stays with that person. And that person might not receive, you know, might not have the experience to receive that in their teens or their 20s. But as we can see with St. Augustine's life, when he has his conversion a little bit later, St. Monica's prayers never left her son. So parents who are listening to this, grandparents that are listening to this, never give up on your children, never give up on your grandchildren, but continue to pray. So his life of fruitless seedlings of grief and restless weariness weighs more and more on Augustine as he yearns for, prof for profound spiritual change in his life. Years pass as the tension between these two movements mounts and he still remains unable to act. And just a quick sidebar, dear friends, again, who have been praying for your loved ones and that they have, who have wandered off the path. St. Augustine's life story is one of many, including St. Ignatius, from saint, first from sinner to saint. And we have an opportunity to pray tonight with the relics of both St. Augustine and St. Ignatius a little bit later. And I just wanna encourage you when we come to that prayer time to pray for our loved ones and we will pray for an increase in hope in ourselves. So even in an even greater fervor and trust in the Lord. So all of this stirring is happening in St. Augustine and a day comes when he sits uh, in on a conversation with his name is Pontician, Pontitianus, Pontitianus. He is an official in the emperor's court and Alipicus, Elip who is his friend, his intimate friend. So Pontitianus is unaware of the impact that his story is going to have on Augustine. And he begins to share this story that two of his acquaintances, minor officials in the, in the Imperial Rome, had been out walking and they entered the house of some devout Christians and found in their home the life of St. Anthony by St. Augustine, or sorry, the life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius. One of these official, officials began to read the book and learned how young St. Anthony had decisively and joyfully put into practice the words of Jesus to the rich young man. If you would be perfect, go and sell what you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. Struck by this account, the official and his companion decided immediately to do the same. So they too gave up their current way of life and their money and their possessions and they followed the Lord as St. Anthony had. And so this man that recounted the story, then he leaves and he has no idea how this story has impact, impacted St. Augustine. 
And the story awakens this anguish in Augustine as he compares their immediate and vigorous response to God with his own helplessness wavering. St. Augustine described this moment, and this is in his own words. He says, this was the nature of my sickness. I was in torment, reproaching myself more bitterly than ever as I twisted and turned in my chain. I hoped that my chain might be broken once and for all because it was only a small thing that held me now. And you, O oh Lord, never cease to watch over my heart. In your stern mercy, you lashed me with, twin scourge, with a twin scourge of fear and shame in case I should give away once more and the worn and slender remnant of my chain should not be broken but gain new strength and being me all the faster. In my heart, I kept saying, let it be now, let it be now. And merely by saying this, I was on the point of making the resolution. I was on the point of making it, but I did not succeed. This vocabulary, end of quote. So this vocabulary is filled with tension. St. Augustine is in torment. And he reproaches himself more bitterly than ever. Yet he's aware that God is at work in his affliction of his heart. He expresses this by striking this striking phrase, or sorry, this striking phrase, your stern mercy. So St. Augustine sees that God is merciful um, in his sternness towards him. We can also see a shift in Augustine's words from his pursuit of self-indulgence and no regard to God to a turning towards God. These two goals are radically opposite. Listening to, wait, to, listen to what St. Augustine says happens to him in this next subtle yet powerful moment of the heart that restrains him from going forward in his new goal. And we'll see this, we'll see the, when, when I read this quote, you will see the actual whispering. So the whispering, I've got a, a, vision, a picture up there to show you just this whispering and how sneaky the enemy can be. So all, this is a quote, this is from St. Augustine. All my old attachments plucked at my garment of flesh and whispered. So this is, this is the enemy preying on him. Are you going to dismiss us from this moment? We shall never be with you again, forever and ever. From this moment, you will never be allowed to do this or that forevermore. I'm, end of quote. Augustine talks about these voices coming, seem, seeming to come back to him and trying to turn his head towards them. So here's this battle. We can see this battle happening in St. Augustine's life. God is calling him forward. The enemy is tapping him on the back and saying, no, 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 turn around, look at me. He wanted to go forward, yet in his state of indecision, they kept Augustine from shaking himself free of them and leaping across the barrier to the other side where God was calling him. So we see this battle, we can actually see it in this, this beautiful text of St. Augustine and how the enemy works how the enemy strikes at us. And it's so subtle when we think of this. You know, we could think of oh, numerous things, you know, where we, we set ourselves to maybe do online adoration at home and, you know, something creeps up uh, and we think, oh no, maybe I just need to call so-and-so or maybe I just need to finish this little bit of work or perhaps we're heading out to daily mass and, you know, the weather isn't great and, it's raining and our rain, we forgot our umbrella in the car. And, and you can see how we start to talk ourselves out of this. But this is how the enemy so sneakily works on us to have us uh, turn from the good thing that God is calling us to do. So if we look at this and we get on our spiritual tool belt, we look at the, that the tools avail themselves to St. Augustine. So St. Augustine is aware. He's aware of this. This story, as he's listening, he's aware that this story is, isn't just a story about, 
you know, these two officials that sort of leave their job and go and follow Jesus. This is a preparation. God has prepared his heart for this story. And he's aware. So he's aware that the, the effect that it has on him. And then the bad spirit calls him out. And notice the language that, it, that Augustine uses from behind, from the back. He wants to go forward. And this is a directional change that he's presented with. He needs to make a decision. So this is where we get in. So he's aware, that's the top one, that he's understanding. He needs to make a decision. But what doesn't he do? He doesn't decide. He said that, that he is indecisive. And it was that indecision that, you know, the enemy kind of triumphed for a little bit and, and got him into that place where he was feeling uh, a place of despair. So he wanted to go forward and this directional change that he was presented with needed the decision and the awareness is there and his wording changes as he describes what happens next. This is the words of St. Augustine. But by now, I had turned my eyes elsewhere. And while I was trembling at the barrier on the other side, I could see the chaste beauty of continence in all her serene, unsullied joy as she modestly beckoned me to cross over and to hesitate no more. She stretched out her loving hands to welcome and embrace me, holding up a host of good examples to my sight. With her were countless boys and girls, great numbers of the young and peoples of all ages. In their midst was Countenance herself, not barren, but a fruitful mother of children, of joys born to you, O Lord, her spouse. She smiled at me and gave me courage as though she was saying, can you not do what these men and women do? Do you think that they do you think that they find the strength to do it themselves and not in the Lord their God? Why do you stand in your own strength and fail? Cast yourself upon God, have no fear. He will not shrink away and let you fall. Cast yourself upon him without fear, for he will welcome you and cure you of your ills. End of quote. So those are the words of St. Augustine. And we see this consolation, this consolation visit him. And that is the consolation of the Lord. The Lord beckons us. So again, we're still talking about the, the first rule here, but he's beckoning us and he's calling us into that uh, gentle state. Augustine senses loving hands outstretched to him, a smile that gives him courage. He's not alone. New hope stirs within him, and he has led to the examples of others who have struggled and have found strength in God. At this point, Augustine can contain himself no longer, and he flings under a tree as tears begin to fall. And then he hears the voice, take and read, and his life is remade. So the type of experience Ignatius explains is the first rule, the first of the two rules, and they clarify the foundational issues in all discernment of spirits. That the spirits we discern act in our hearts in contrasting ways, depending on the fundamental direction of our spiritual lives, away from or towards God. The first movement is away from God to a life of self-indulgence, where moral boundaries are ignored, seen in the young life of St. Augustine. The second is born of a growing weariness of the heart, which this lifestyle engenders and reverses the first. Augustine increasingly longs to reject this meaningful life, uh, uh, to reject his meaningful, sorry. Augustine increasingly longs to reject the life and to reach this meaningful life of God and to move towards God. These two fundamental directions of our spiritual life as evidenced in St. Augustine's spirit, experience are as, followed, so, sorry, are as follows. The first, to move away from God and towards sin. So that's in the first rule. The second um, we see here is proper 
for the good spirit to bite and sadden and place obstacles. When we're moving towards the Lord, the enemy wants us to look back and to remember. You know, maybe it's remembering our own sin. Maybe it's remembering things that we've already confessed. And we know as Catholics, when we've confessed our sin, it is done. When we receive absolution, we're not supposed to be looking back. Are we supposed to be praying in reparation? Absolutely. But we're not to be looking back. And sometimes that can happen in scrupulosity. The enemy can, can rest there too. And constantly bringing us back to a place of our life where we were, we were struggling. So that the first rule, so rule one, um, that really doesn't apply. It doesn't really apply to us. If we're studying these rules, then more than likely we are in rule two. two. So St. Ignatius' first rule doesn't uh, apply to people who are living, you know, um, who, apply, sorry, St. Ignatius' first rule applies to people who are living according to the flesh. And we might know somebody that fits this description. I know several people very close to me who are. And I hope that St. Augustine and St. Ignatius' conversion stories bring you a ray of hope as it brings me a ray of hope in intercessory prayer tonight as we are praying for one another's intentions and bringing them before the relics of St. Augustine and St. Ignatius. So let us place the people that we know who fit this description of rule one at the tabernacle tonight and ask our Lord to give them the grace they need through the intercession of Our Lady of the Cape and Saints Ignatius and Augustine. And if this, if you're watching the recording, then at some point, I do encourage you to do some online adoration, or if you're privileged enough to have adoration where you live, then seek out adoration, sit before the Lord and bring those people to the Lord. Because I know in my heart that you're listening to this, you're learning about this because God has a plan. He has a plan not only for your life, but also for the lives of the people that you love. And referring to the second rule, so the reverse happens. The, the first move toward God and away from sin, indeed away from every form of serious sin. So in the Catholic tradition, we call that mortal sin. And otherwise, that's known as venial sin. Some of us may find ourselves here, yearning for saintly perfection, but falling into mortal sin, or continually into venial sin. In St. Ignatius's rules, he describes the action of the two spirits in the person moving away from God and moving from serious sin, as in the case of the latter with Augustine and his spiritual renewal. So if this is you and you find that you are really struggling with mortal sin, availing yourself to the sacraments is one of the best things that you can do. Confession is like I've heard priests say, confession is like a mini exorcism. I mean, the graces of confession, it's a healing sacrament, but it also gives spiritual authority where authority needs to be. And that's the beauty of our sacraments. There is authority in the sacraments. So we make use of confession. And if this is you, and you know, you're listening to this recording, and this is, this is stirring in your heart, and you're thinking, wow, I haven't been to church in a long time. I've been, you know, away from mass for a while. I really encourage you to go to confession first. Sometimes people think the first thing that, that they should do is that they should, you know, go to mass and receive the blessed sacrament. But I caution people who are in mortal sin. This is not the trajectory that we want to do. We want to avail ourselves to confession first. In scripture, St. Paul tells us that if we eat God irreverently, if we consume him irreverently, then we are eating our own condemnation. Friends, we don't want to do that. So if this is you and you've been away from the church for a while, if you have, um, if this is, you know, sparking something in you and blessed be God, if it is, then I just encourage you to make a time, seek confession, go to confession first, and then receive Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. At any time, you don't have to go to confession in order to go to adoration. So at any time you can sit and be with Jesus in adoration. But the graces that come from repairing our relationship with Jesus after a long time outside of the church 
or perhaps falling into mortal sin, the graces that abound in confession are beyond, beyond. Saints have written about this. Saints have talked about this. Some mystics have actually seen these graces. So again, friend, if this is you and you have been away from the church for a long time, I just want to encourage you to, to seek out confession, to avail yourself to the healing balm of confession, knowing that you've said your sins, you've made your peace, receiving, you know, absolution. It is an incredible grace. It is an incredible triumph against the enemy. The confessional, you know, that's where the devil cowers. There's no power there. He has no power in the sacraments. We need to make ourselves avail to the, to the sacraments so that we're growing and growing in the right direction. Okay, so let's look at St. Ignatius's text regarding the second rule. So the sec in the second rule, in persons who are going on intensely purifying their sins, and I consider us who are watching this live tonight as people who are serious about you know, growing in holiness and rising from good to better in the service of God our Lord, the method is contrary to that of the first rule. For then it is proper for the evil spirit to bite, sadden, and place obstacles disquieting with false reason so that the person may not go forward. These are some of the things that I just talked about a little while ago about, you know, I want to go to mass. I want to go to daily mass. It's raining outside. The umbrella's in the car. And all of these ideas sort of get tripped up in our head like we can't do what we're supposed to do. These, this is the work of the enemy. This is the work or we get distracted on our phone or we get distracted watching, you know, we say we're going to watch one show on Netflix or on, a, you know, even a good show. It could be like a great Christian show. And then that one leads to another one and another one. And we've soon forgotten the rosary. These are the ways that the enemy distracts us and brings us, you know, into a place where we're, we're, not, we're not growing in prayer. We're not growing in the things that we should be. And it is proper for the good spirit to give courage and strength, console, consolation, tears, inspirations, and quiet, easing and taking away all obstacles so that person may go forward in doing good. And we see this. I don't know if you've ever um, thought, oh, I don't really want to go, and I shouldn't say this, but I've struggled with this myself. I don't know if I want to go to daily mass. I've got, you know, all this work I need to do. I've got all this stuff I need to do. But once you make the effort and then you go to mass and it's like, ah, oh, why did I even doubt that? Why did I even doubt going to mass? Or perhaps, you know, you're rushing around and you're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stay after mass and pray the rosary. Um, although you've made that plan, you're like, okay, well, Tuesdays or Thursdays are the days that I stay after mass and I pray the rosary. But, but the Lord, once you do that, once you commit to what you said that you're going to do, then the Lord always brings his, his, balm, his healing, his beautiful grace. And then we know that we're in the right place. And it's beautiful that we're journeying and learning about these things so that we can continue to be edified by these beautiful graces that our Lord and our Lady have for us. So I love, love, love this scripture where sin abounded, grace did abound, did more abound. So in the lives again of St. Augustine, in the lives of St. Ignatius, we see this. The enemy, um, the, we see the enemy work in the imagination and the good spirit work in the conscience. So that's again with the rule one. When a person is having a conversion experience like St. Augustine and St. Ignatius, the good spirits work in their conscience and through their rational power and moral judgment, awakening them to a true understanding of their unhappy condition and an accompanying sense of inner trouble. So sometimes these questions, you know, can come to this. And if you're watching the recording of this, and this is, you know, something that you are struggling with right now, these are some of the questions that can arise in the heart of a person who God is calling. Are you really happy living this way? Can you continue to live in such inner emptiness? These are questions we need to ask ourselves if we're going from mortal sin to mortal sin. Is not life meant to be more than this? Why do you hurt those who love you love and who need you the way that you do? 
in your deepest heart, you yearn for fulfillment that you cannot find living this way. Why will you not seek it where it can be found? As it draws, as it draws to an end, you'll be happy looking back on your life. That's right, as it draws to an end, will you be happy looking at the life that you're leading now? And I can say this just as someone who finished her thanatology course, I studied death, dying, grief, and bereavement. And these are real life cases that I've read about and um, read stories about the worst kind of death in people who were secular were people who lived a life that they were proud of. And their death was very traumatic. Their death was um, like the people who were supporting them. It was not a good death, we'll put it that way. The best deaths, and this is written from secular writers, the best deaths were the deaths of people who died with faith, who died living the life that they were supposed to let live, who died living in, and serving the Lord. So other questions, such stirrings are the action of the good spirit, rousing godly sorrow that produces repentance without regret. So we speak and we speak in truly of our Lord and our God as a God of peace. Yet our God above all is a God of love, a God who loves us too much to abandon us when we turn the other way. So it is a good thing in that second rule that God is, you know, pinching us a little bit and saying, you know, come, come to the peace, come to where you're going to find rest for your soul and encouraging us with those signal graces that we know that our Lord can do and our lady certainly through, through our Lord or through the intercession of our lady as well. So as we wrap up this study portion of our evening tonight, let us take the information that we have learned and apply it to prayer for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our struggling souls in the world. May God have mercy and meet us and guide us to his sacred heart.